welcome to the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Porter, and I'm joined this week by my guest co-host, Craig Ross. Hi, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, Craig, for for the lovely people at home, on the bus, or wherever they are, who are you? I'm just a nerd that you managed to find in Games Workshop or something, and we've been playing narrative campaigns for a while now. Yeah, I think, I and for think, some reason you invited me to your wedding, which I thought was very touching. Thank you. Yeah, well, you you are my friend, so. Oh yeah, there's that. I should mention I am Ben's friend. I'm yeah. using nepotism to get in the podcast. Yeah, but um, I, I think when you, when you talk about uh, the the narrative campaign, I think we first met during the Crimson Skies campaign. Yeah. Which was the same campaign where we all first met Josh, and Callum. And a whole bunch of the other people that have been on the podcast. and It was a historically significant event, yeah, to call it that. At least in our eyes, it was yeah. historically significant. It's important to me. Yeah, it's uh, right in the feels. <sighs> yeah. Um, so this week, we're going to talk a bit about price creep in board games, because it's a bit of a problem. Well, we all love a little lesson in economics, so... yeah. Um, but we'll talk about that later. But right now, we're uh, we'll talk about what we've been up to and what's been happening. Well, let's address the elephant in the room, which is the end of our Firestorm campaign for Age of Sigmar. Yep. So this campaign has been running since I think October, November. Do not ask me about time periods. It's been running a while. Um, because I was thinking about this today. Uh, you and I have been in four narrative campaigns together. <laughs> that uh, many, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Um, two of which uh, were false starts, and two of which are successes. Yeah, so, success. So we're we're fifty there, you know. I, by, by success, I mean that we saw them through from start to finish. Yep. Um, because if if you remember, we did Death on the Dunes. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Which we had that crack in final battle for that. We, no, that died a death. Death of Dunes. Oh yeah, like you show see us show so much I remember. Eh? Yeah, yeah, that was the one that we were doing in Spellbound. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember yeah. this one now. That that died a death, and then uh, all of our stuff got stolen. Yeah. Well, I'll leave that. That's a story for another time. Yeah. Um, and then the the other false start we had was um, earlier last year. We tried to do a Path to Glory campaign. Yeah, that but never that happened. but that was before they brought out the Path to Glory campaign supplement. Um, because prior to that, it was horribly unbalanced. Oh, imagine playing Stormcast. Yeah. Just like, oh yeah, this Stormcast worth about unit worth about three hundred points is what you get. Well, everyone else gets about a hundred point equivalent. And, and under the old Path to Glory rules, you could actually do like a full warband that was just Star Drakes. That's not a warband. So it's like you could just ha- you could just rock up with four massive dragons. And your poor wee pals got like got like if your ten opponent dwarfs. if your opponent has um one model that has more than the combined muscle mass of your entire army, that's not a warband. No, so needless to say, that was nipped in the bud. It's been redressed. Um, but uh, so the the other campaign that was a success was the Crimson Skies campaign, which, which was that was massive. Yeah. That went on for like eight months. There was loads of people in it. And uh, that 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 was actually where uh, a lot of us met. Um, so it's a special place in our hearts. Um, but th- this campaign, uh, we used the Firestorm supplement, mm-hmm. um, and we, we actually jumped into the campaign not long after the supplement came out. Yeah, we got it pretty quickly. Yeah, and uh, that that's us just finished. And it was well, all right. I very much enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, so. The over, not that it's all that important in a narrative-driven campaign, but the overall winner uh, was uh, Destruction. Uh, Callum's uh, iron jaws is, made of yeah, is, literal fucking iron. He's he's roided out orcs, um, but um, on Sunday the we had a eighth finale. eighth. So it's a two two days prior to recording. Um, we had a great big battle to round off the campaign in Common Ground Games. Sterling, a lovely place. Yep, uh, run by the, the lovely Steve Fettis. What a man, 
Yeah. What an absolute legend. Yeah. And um, we so we did six thousand points aside, which is three times the normal amount that you have in an Age of Sigmar game. With about one point three three times the amount of space you would have in a yep. two thousand point game. And it was uh, quite a ruckus. A ruckus, a brawl, if you will. Uh, a stramash. Yes. Um, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I might have not rolled as quite as well as I like to. Yeah. Uh, seeing my uh, all two of my three large monsters stuck in a single cavalry unit for the entire game and not kill it was not just any cavalry. Giant pig riders. Yeah, like I had two chimeras stuck into five pig riders, and for about four turns of the game, they couldn't kill him. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it. With dice rolls were unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, the idea was um, the winning side from the points we'd accumulated had the advantage of being on the objective for the whole campaign at the start of the battle, whereas the losing side, the sec well second. Uh, me and Colin, Sinch players, were attempting to take it from us, and both sides took the third and fourth place yeah. sides as mercenaries. It is, it is worth saying that although that that scenario seems quite asymmetrical, it was deliberately skewed in Callum's favour oh. because he'd chosen to gamble all of his points on this last battle. Yeah, so. of course. I don't like having it in favour of the person who was winning the campaign makes perfect sense. Yeah. It was meant to be an opportunity for us to play particularly well and mm. we could maybe claw it back. We didn't play very well. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there's a bit of dissension among the ranks. Well, that's that's just what happens when me and Colin play. Yeah. There's a bit of camaraderie going on there. Yeah. Uh, I play Mortals and Co Colin plays Siege. Yeah. And our character, so, so you're even, mortal chaos warriors. On, on yeah, on yeah. a on a narrative level, our characters don't get on. Yep. On a personal level, we get on. Yeah. But I like to have a bit of um, banter. Banter, yes. if you will. I like to uh, lighten the mood of a bit of jostling. Bit of back and forth. So uh, a bit of repartee. If anyone was just coming up to the table and didn't know us at all, you'd probably think we were arguing. It was not arguing. We just uh, they 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 may they may have thought Colin was getting bullied. Well, if Colin didn't cheat so much, he wouldn't get bullied. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's that's not a truth. Colin is a perfectly fine, if slightly rules lawyer, really character a yeah. character player. Yeah, he but doesn't as cheat. as Colin points out, being a rules lawyer is a double edged sword. Because there's times where where he's pointed out, actually, you wiped out my entire unit there. You yeah, know, like, if you like, Colin. Uh, yeah, sometimes I have to remind him of things as well. I'm mm. I feel like I'm a bit of a balancing force on that side. Yeah. The, the calm, reserved mortals and the absolute batshit zinch demons, yeah. if you will. But yeah, um. So the the in summary, the game went horribly for you guys. Oh, it was, could not have gone worse. Uh, it was great for Callum and myself, and I have to say it was quite nice. Uh, and this is one of the things that I really like about Age of Sigmar, is that, um, g given the way that the story's gone and the the new background for a lot of the armies and factions, it is not completely outlandish for orcs and fire slayers to be working alongside each other. The old. Warhammer 8th edition saying was full of sworn enemies who've been at war from since time immemorial. There's not a lot of room for oh, politics. A lot, a lot of it was copy and pasted from Tolkien. So. Yeah, like there was not a lot of room for politics. Yeah. Age of Sigmar uh, has brought a lot of identity for itself. It's uh, a, lot of a lot of creativity in it that I don't think it gets enough credit for. But what it has done is opened up a lot of possibilities for a lot of Opposed factions with similar goals to work together in mm -hmm. new and refreshing ways. I could see my chaos, given my character's backstory, working alongside. They just worked alongside Death. It was distasteful, but she did it. Mm -hmm. She could work alongside Order under the, against Chaos under the right circumstances mm -hmm. to further her own personal goals. There's that, a lot. That's very Zinchy as well, isn't it? You well, know? don't tell Anya that, because yeah. despite being a type of Zinch, she hates Zinch. Yeah. 
And Anya is your character as well. It's worth saying she's not some crazy person. No, it's just a, just a random we pulled off of the streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so no, we've all got our own characters, and me and Ben in particular like have a lot of backstory for our characters. Yeah. I'm planning on doing a bit of writing to cover up the last bit, and so are you. Mm-hmm. And I think that'll tie off the whole thing narratively very well. Yep. Which will be a nice wee read at the end. I, I think um, to to quickly, if we both pick a highlight for that last battle, for me it has to be uh, Folkvar, uh, my general, my my character, uh, charging at Colin's uh, big gribbly demon prince and walloping him. Putting the boot in, as it yeah. were. Yeah, and he, the, he, he took him out of the fight. That's a very old, like, that, that rivalry's been going on since uh, Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Yeah. And it was always good to see those rivalries tied up at the end of a great narrative battle of just the, the sworn rivals kicking fuck out of each other. That's yeah. what we want. What, narratively. So your your my, highlight? My best, like, there was a lot of good moments now. Narratively, it was. Anya, my um, she is a she's a gold gone somewhere in a real suit, and I've managed to her setup allows her to be very tanky in combat. Mm-hmm. So she charged alone into a unit of fifteen orc brutes, which are these massive combat units. They're they're like um, for anyone that doesn't know, um, they're actually a step up from a black orc. These they're. guys are huge, and she didn't take a single wound. And wow. then, yeah, not a single one saved everything. Then the orcs just decided to leave it, ran away. And then for the second time in this campaign, her sworn enemy, the Sigmarites, the Lord Relictor, not the Lord Relictor. Lord, Lord Ordinator. Points his... Who, who's, if if you take an engineer and a prophet and mix it all together, you'd have a Lord Ordinator. So for the second time, he points the dwarf organ gun at her, opens up, and she gets butchered. So, narratively... Tying up the failure of uh, Anya's campaign is being struck down twice by her most hated enemy. The, the fickle finger of fate, as it were. So, yeah, um, yeah, I think that, like, as the one side that the last battle was, I think there was lots of really good narrative moments in it, and you can't ask for much more than that. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 I felt it was quite a satisfying experience. Um, and I hope everyone else did. Obviously, it does help when you win. Of course. But um, the the great thing about narrative gaming is that even if you don't actually win the game, because you've got this character and all this backstory and all these motivations, you've almost got all these little sub objectives mm-hmm. um, that you yeah. can complete. So, like, like the last minute, Anya taking a pot shot at the Lord Ordinator just because she could and utterly fucking it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I feel like that failure is a good chance for me to put Anya to rest, to rest for a wee while and work mm-hmm. on a new army project, which brings us nicely on to the IDNF Deepkin. Yeah, so they were announced at Adepticon. They, were like, they, they did a, a great big reveal. I think Adepticon is actually the biggest single reveal the they, Games Workshop have they ever brought, done. They, they said so much. They said so many things, and we were just having a wee... We are all having a wee moment. It was emotional. It was emotional. Yeah. Um, Plastic Sisters of Battle. I don't care about that. For me, it was was actually seeing the um, confirmation that they're planning on releasing more warbands and cards for Shadespire after the the last um, Stormcast and Corn set. Shadespire seems to have been a real success for them. Yeah, massive. Good that they're continuing to support it. Yeah, but the so the Ideneth Deepkin uh, this week they actually revealed some of the the rules for the army. The thing that's probably most interesting is the Tides of Death. The way it works is that obviously it's a, it's an aquatic themed army, so that that's all thematic for them. To clarify, floating giant tortoises. With that's that's a turtle. Actually. Turtle, of course, it's a turtle. Yeah. Sorry, a turtle with a hull down its back. Yeah, that's their big monster. It's so good. What what more could you want? So the way tides of death work is it it gives the the army this this rhythm in mm-hmm. battle that that mirrors the the tides. Yeah. Um. So it does mean that they perform in a very consistent way. Um. It it, it feels 
quite similar to the the cycle of decay that you've mm. got for Nurgle or the Fire Slayer's runes in that every turn you get a different thing to do with the army. But the, the, the difference with the Ideneth Deepkin is it happens in a, a consistent pattern. If you're a 40k player, you'll be familiar with Power from Pain, which is a Dark Elder ability, which slowly builds up their... They have they start off with a 6-up Feel No Pain save, they get re-rolls to charges, and the longer the battle goes on for it, the more benefits they get. This is similar but different in that instead of cumulative bonuses, it gives you a single bonus for that round that reflects where you want to be at that stage in the battle, which is really interesting. So you start off with Low Tide, which gives you bonuses against shooting, mm -hmm. uh, your saves against shooting. So, so that, that gives you the opportunity to advance up the board without yes. um, taking too much damage. So then you get Flood Tide. Uh, at this point, you can run and either shoot or charge in the same turn. So this, after you've weathered the, the first one, this gives you the chance to get into where you want to go mm -hmm. really quick without before, without the benefit of cover from the low tide you want to be moving fast in flood tide mm -hmm. then for turn 3 gives you high tide once you're where you want to go this lets you, all your units get to fight first in combat imagine you're playing 40k all your charging units get to go first mm -hmm. similar thing, all your units get to attack before your enemies well, get we, to use we were actually saying earlier when we were talking about this that it's a lot like um, the always strikes first rule that, that mm -hmm. all elves had back in 8th edition Um which was was a little bit gross. It was absolutely disgusting. Um, but the, here it feels reasonably balanced because you know you're you're always going to have this one turn where you get to use it, and it's up to you to capitalize upon it. Yeah, this is why these rules so these rules are so good because it gives you beats that you want to meet. Mm -hmm. These are they're powerful benefits, very powerful. But you as a player have to keep time with them. You want to be able to in a position where those are actually useful for you. If you've lagged behind, you're not where you want to be, you won't, you'll miss high tide. Yeah. You won't be in combat with your best units, you'll miss the chance. So, falling from high tide is the fourth and final one is ebb tide, at which point your units can retreat and then either shoot or charge. So your units in com your shooting units that are being run double combat, or your melee units that basically finish what they need to do can pull out and then reposition and still do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then from turn five on, it repeats if you go on that long. So it's that idea of it being a cycle, like the tides in real life? Yeah. So um, very cool, very in flavour, but at the same time, it gives you an army that's going to behave in quite a consistent way. It's predictable. Yeah, so it's, it could be a double-edged sword. Absolutely, it's a double-edged sword. Very strong buffs, but you have to keep beat with them and your opponent can see when it's coming. Yep. Um, the the other interesting uh, rule that the the deep can have is forgotten nightmares, um, which um, it pertains mainly to missile weapons, uh, and it it basically says that because the deep can are so horrifying and freak people out, um, models with this rule can only be targeted by miss missile weapons if they're the closest visible enemy unit. For, for reference, this rule is called Forgotten Nightmares, and it is basically Lovecraft the rule. Yep. You want to forget something that's so terrifying. Uh, functionally, I think it's very interesting. Um, the way it's worded seems to hint that not everything in the army is going to have it. Yeah, I suspect... Given the success of similar rules in 40k, it's going to be mainly for characters. Yeah. Because it's going to it means your characters can't be sniped off the table. Because that, that's one of the most annoying things in the game at the moment, right? Is is your characters just being shot off? In, yeah, like, like turn one and two. Ask a blood uh, blood bound player. Yeah. Like an army that relies so heavily on characters that are very fragile and absolutely no response to shooting. Blood bound players are very vulnerable to shooting attacks. Whereas your IDNF now are going to just go, oh, so what? Yeah. I think I think this is going to be offset by the fact that from what we've seen of the army so far, they are quite fragile. Absolutely. We've so seen it. If, 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 for example, something like Fire Slayers had a rule like that, it would be bonkers. Yes. But um, that's because they're super tough. But that, that that's how they deal with shooting. Yeah. Whereas an, an army like... Uh, 
well, anything Elvy really. Yeah. It tends to be a bit more fragile. Yeah, the, the 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 usefulness of the rule is offset by your basic infantry are very fragile. We're talking one wound, five up saves, not very high bravery. Mm. So this is the, like they're, but they have high damage output. So you're gonna balance. All right, I want keeping your character safe against the fact your units are gonna be melting to ranged attacks anyway. Yeah. This is another reason why, particularly, I thought high tide was so useful, because no. I'll, in Age of Sigmar, the one unit, then the next unit on your opponent's side attacking, tends to punish small units by making it easy to kill them before they attack, especially with fragile units like this. You go, I've got two units of ten of these guys, one gets to attack, then the enemy goes, all right, I've got to hit this one before they attack. So it can be hard to utilize multiple small units, whereas being able to get all of your guys to attack at once means you have an opportunity to attack of units that might die otherwise before mm-hmm. they get to attack. Again, though, you have to time it. Yeah, like that's a lot of I don't know. There's a there's a rhythm to the army, isn't there? Yeah, if you can't play to the rhythm, then that's it. If you if you can't take the beat, so if uh, I suggest maybe uh, providing your own soundtrack. Yep. Maybe a bit of uh, dubstep. I was thinking more maybe like you know some jams from the Little Mermaid, something like (laughs) that. You know, Ariel, help me. Yeah. Um. But uh, lastly, with the Deepkin, they they um, spoiled the profile for the Namarti Thralls, so which is, are your core troops for so, the army. So this is what we were talking about, this core unit that has high, very high damage output for a core unit, but very fragile. You're going to be able to pick them off relatively easily. Yeah, they, that, they see, they seem, that, that seems to be a thing with this army, they're... they're they're, they're very fast. They've got some interesting ways of, of avoiding damage, of dodging it, but they're very much glass cannon. Even with your cover bonus at low tide, you're still talking a four up save. Any amount of rend is going to absolutely butcher these guys. Yeah. So, um, excited to actually get a look at the Battle Tome when that comes out. I think they're going for pre order this week. Um, and the new Warbands for Shadespire will be releasing this week as well, so it'll be interesting to see them. I'm buzzing. I don't have Deepkin or, like, my aesthetic. Yeah. If... I'm big aquatic themes, Lovecraftian yeah. themes, all about that. Yeah. You, you you love quite ethereal armies. Yeah. yeah. I'm planning on... Trying... Coincidentally, a lot of them are elven, so... Well, yeah, like, I'm not particularly into elves in particular, it's just... The aesthetics that they represent tend to be appealing to me. Yeah. Uh, the Mistweaver Sai from the uh, Silver Tower, absolutely love that model. Mm-hmm. Not seen an army to go with it yet, but you'll be like, I'll be playing it anyway. Yeah, well, she definitely fit with these guys. Yeah, like I'm planning on running a mixed order army with all sorts of just. Oh, I like this model. It's pretty. I'm going to use it. And nothing the, wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. There's actually a guy on um, one of the Facebook groups today, and he was complaining that. They were releasing the battle tome alongside a bunch of models, and he was saying, "What's the point of that? Because then we don't know what's good." And I, I mean, I, I, I was all over that thread <laughs> because I was like, "Look, some people are into Warhammer just to buy models, in which case your argument is irrelevant." But there, there's this mindset among tournament players that everything should be done their way. Yeah, this, the release structure for new armies is not a tournament player friendly uh, structure. They release the battle. But it's, to- but it's because it has to appeal to everyone, right? Yeah, like I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I believe that's a good has thing. Has to appeal to collectors, has to appeal to fluffy gamers. Well, like, well, how they release it is uh, in stages. Like, the battle, t- the battle tone comes out, they'll release the core unit and a couple mm-hmm. of characters. Then the next week, they'll release more units. It'll t- usually take them three or four weeks to release the whole army. Well, that's a good point. They release the core units alongside the battle tome. So it's like, why are you complaining? You need them anyway. Yeah. If you're going to a tournament. That's, or you could just wait till next week and buy them next week. It's not going to yeah. kill you. But, like, no one can run a tournament army straight after the battle tome is released anyway because you just don't have the options. No. The, those are coming next week. Yeah. So just be patient. You're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take you a few weeks to build the models and paint them anyway. Yeah. And I must say, I do prefer the slow trickle of releases as opposed to what they used to do, where it was just everything at the end of a month. 
it's it's yeah it's more it's friendlier on your wallet you're not yeah. buying everything at once it gives you time to work on things while you wait for other things to release and yeah you can't really play the entire army as soon as the battle token comes out but just be patient yeah that uh, talk of wallet is an excellent segue onto the the subject for this week I'm a regular host already yep um, price creep in board games this was something I hadn't thought about until you brought it up as soon as I came over so yeah. uh, I've, I've been formulating some thoughts over it and yeah. I think there's a lot to well, it's, it's definitely a problem isn't it yes uh, because it was just a few years ago where the, the average price for a board game was about £40 I think so what we're and seeing now, now it's like 60 and the, and there's quite a lot of games that are pushing up to 80 and 90 in price now. We used to see those prices for some games though, like Fantasy Flight games in particular have never been cheap because of the amount of bits and bobs that they put in their box, lots of plastic models, they yeah. tend to have a high price point. Things like Twilight Imperium used to set you back almost £100. It's it's way over a hundred pounds now. So, yeah, yeah. I, well, so there's definitely been like obviously you can contribute some of this to inflation, but it's impossible to talk about the state of board games as they are without bringing up Kickstarter because Kickstarter has completely changed the way that people purchase board games. Yeah, and whether or not that's responsible for price rises is another question entirely. But what we've seen is an evolution in how people buy it's interesting that you say that actually about it being responsible for price increases because asmodee which are they they're a huge distributor i'm familiar with them yeah yeah yeah. asmodee said recently that they've not increased their output over the past few years that's interesting because asmodee from what i've been told are basic they're close to monopoly when it comes to distribution yeah like I've actually heard some worrying things about that, but that's a story for another time. Yeah. But so you're saying they haven't been selling more things? Yeah. Well, that that's essentially what it means, doesn't it? If if they're not increasing their output, yeah, they're they're just not they're not um, manufacturing, and they're therefore not selling any, you know, or at least it's probably gone up a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I think what they mean by that is that it's not gone up exponentially. Uh, in the same in the way that you'd expect in the middle of a board gaming boom. Well, you were saying earlier, like, by board gaming is becoming increasingly more popular, but I think most of that applies to more casual games. Like, Catan has become incredibly popular. D and D's like, massive. D and D, yeah, like that's like a mainstream thing now. Uh, yeah, and like that's like that helping t- helping people tell stories and be all creative. Like, yeah, I'm all into that. Oh yeah, it's great, but, but it's if... like like you say, it, um, as far as games go, it's you know unless you're you're planning on DMing, D and D's pretty light on your wallet. Yeah, like lots of source books. Uh, source books can boost yeah. the price up, but you you only need like the the player's handbook yeah. at core. Like Maybe Xanathar's Guide if you're getting into things. Yeah, a bit that, more that's for... that's a later purchase. Yeah, like, D and D can be quite expensive, but it's still not extortionate. If we're talking about board games at the board game aficionado level, like people who get into the really big ones, like uh, fa- things that Fantasy Flight put out, things that like I don't know, um, Civilization the board game. Sure, yeah, even yeah. that's quite cheap. Yeah. But you, you know when a board game is for board game players or when it's for, I don't want to say casuals because I don't want no, to buy into no, that. But, but, you're, you know. but you're right because price is a barrier to entry. Exactly. And people who, those extensive board games are more expensive for a number of reasons. They are more heavy on rules and mm-hmm. peripherals, which is something that more serious players will appreciate. There will be less people buying them, so they need to justify the production. And people who are heavy into board games will be willing to spend more game money on board uh-huh. games. So you price for the market. But the market is getting more expensive. Now, the thing I wanted to bring up like a kick- Kickstarter was what Kickstarter was when it launched and what Kickstarter is now. When yeah. Kickstarter was launched, it was to invest in new products that people had pitched on to Kickstarter. Well, the, the, the name was pretty self-explanatory, wasn't it? So there was a lot of new uh, faces, like people who hadn't produced games before. It was meant to be 
for innovation. It was mm. for anybody like if you're if you're not and, and to, to to be fair for for like technology and things, it still is. But board games is something unusual has happened to board games in that where we at first we saw people who didn't have much experience in the industry pitching new concepts, having them funded through Kickstarter and then providing to the Kickstarter backers. Mm. Obviously, it's a risky process because that's what investing is. You don't know if you're going to get your money back. What it is now, as you pointed out earlier, is a glorified pre-order service. Mm -hmm. We're talking about games already designed and largely already funded and are just being put through Kickstarter. Well, I, I mean, as, as you know, I know quite a, a number of designers uh, through doing this podcast and mo most of them have at some point or another had contact with Kickstarter, you know, whether they were using it or whether they were helping someone promote mm -hmm. it. And pretty much all of them say you, you, you're not actually pitching an idea in Kickstarter. You, you, the expectation of the Kickstarter market is for you to have a finished idea. The expectation is a really good way of putting it because that's what Kickstarter has become for board games. The quality of what they're expecting has been produced by companies that are already in production. Like they're posting finished products essentially to Kickstarter. I mean, that is so far away from what Kickstarter was when it began that it's completely changed the market and, like you say, the expectations. And leaving the price aside for now, what that's done to independent distributors is like, well, they can't get uh, they can't get into the market anymore because people are putting their money into these big products and they expect that level of quality and they're not putting their money into fresh new products that actually need to be funded well I was in um, Static a few months ago and I was talking to one of the guys there about Kickstarter and he he was saying uh, I thought this was really interesting, he was saying that um, for, for them as a retailer a, ki a game that's been kickstarted in a lot of ways is dead weight yeah because Be because, because everyone who wanted the game has already got it through Kickstarter how do you retail something that's already been sold to everybody? Yeah. Like, that's an interesting effect on brick and mortar stores or even online stores. It's like the distribution has already happened before they get their hands on it. Mm -hmm. That's putting them out of money. The thing about pricing, to turn back to pricing, mm -hmm. is I think a lot of it is happening where you're seeing the expensive end of board games being represented through Kickstarter instead of through. Uh, retail shops. So so just to illustrate this, okay, three games that I was interested in launched last week. So the first of them is Beneath. Like a lot of Kickstarter games, it's quite component heavy. A lot of, a lot of nice looking pieces um, because it's, it's like we're talking there is expectation from the Kickstarter market. Kickstarter buyers want stuff. Yeah, the the board games that do best on Kickstarter are always ones that have lots of plastic models and pieces and yeah. tokens. So 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 beneath's a good example of that. Eighty pounds. Yeah. Okay. That that's the basic pledge. Uh, Street Fighter miniatures game. Oh, it's a miniatures game. Yep. Chun Li's massive thunder thighs finally. That's it. Encased in plastic. Chun Li's thunder thighs will finally grace your tabletop. I, I think we just got the title of the episode there, <laughs> Chun-Li's Thunderfight. If that does not get your attention, what will? I don't know. You can get a basic pledge for 57, and this is what I think is really cheeky. If you want the stretch goals for this campaign, you need to I've seen fork that for out a hundred. A lot of, like, a lot of times, kick, yeah, like, they'll have staged uh, by, like stretch goals. Like Some of the stretch goals will be like silver level and gold level, depending on how much you pledge. I think that's a bit cheeky, personally. I mean, this is what pledge goals are now. They're... Yeah. And then the last one of the, the three that I've been looking at, God Tear, or God Tear. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. I've heard... God Tear sums better. Yeah, I, I, I've heard that it's supposed to be God Tear. Um, this is by Steamforge Games, the guys that did Guild Ball and Dark Souls. So two very very good and successful. Yeah, and th th games. this one, as you know, anyone could have predicted, has absolutely smashed its stretch goal. Or sorry, its funding goal. But again, basic pledge eighty pounds. Look at what you're getting in there, like the models. Those... And the, but the, these are all active right now. 
So if you're an independent guy, because mm-hmm. let's be honest, these aren't independent. These are big companies yeah. doing this. But if you're an ap- independent guy and you're trying to sell a game on Kickstarter right now, this is what you're up against. Yeah, like these are all established companies. This yeah. isn't what Kickstarter was intended for. But when but, that, you... but like to to answer the the question about pricing, like that, you know, if if people pay this. This is what companies are going to start charging for games. And people are paying it. It's a level of pricing, I feel, is always, that has always been present in board games. Because mm-hmm. you're talking starter boxes for things like Battletech used to cost. That's true. But whether the, whether it's worth it or not isn't really the question. For, for the, the god tier yeah. box, that is. You, yeah. what, it, what we're seeing is not so much a surge in prices of, uh, of like in terms of your maximum price you're paying. It's more of... You're seeing more and more and more of these high-end board games becoming available. Mm-hmm. I think because the market for them through Kickstarter has become more prominent. Like whereas these ones were borderline examples, the ability to show really cool miniatures games over Kickstarter and as basically finished projects is getting a lot more interest into them. The route to purchasing is a lot quicker. When you see something cool and the pledge button's right there, it's a lot easier to make that purchase than it is to make the effort to go to a store mm-hmm. and then hand over the money. No, you, a, a lot of the time you're waiting over a year as well for the, the product. I mean, That's I, not uncommon. I worked. I waited multiple years for Kingdom Death. Mm-hmm. Then I didn't even play it. I sold it. Yeah. <laughs> Paid for my rent. Yeah. That's an interesting example, Kingdom Death. That's like the extreme. Like That was incredibly expensive. And then f- the availability made it even more expensive to sell on. I feel like almost ashamed for taking advantage of that, but I need to pay rent. Yeah, but at the same time, that that was like one guy who had designed this massively ambitious game and had a bit of help from a couple of people, from what I understand. It's absolutely but fringe. Was a, yeah, absolutely. It's a very niche thing. Whereas what we're seeing, like you say, is established companies, basically what you would now pre-order through their own website, or through your local game store, you now pre-order through Kickstarter. There's no doubt that these things are going to come out. It's not an investment. You know it's, the pr- finished product has already been shown to you. I feel like these uh, expensive miniatures games are now becoming very mainstream. So there, you're seeing more and more expensive games because the market for them is now wider. I mean that that maybe sounds hypocritical coming from us because we you know we've just spent twenty minutes talking about games workshop games, but. The, the difference with the Games Workshop games, yeah, they do have the box sets, but at the same time, you decide the degree to which you invest in those games. Mm-hmm. If you just want a little skirmish warband that you pull out every few months to play with your friends, you can do that. Or if you want to go all out and have that humongous army of like 6,000 points or whatever, you can do that as well. The, the problem I see with a lot of these is that you're forced to spend a lot of money on it. I mean, I'm... And you, you know, you, how are you going to know if you enjoy it? It's a lot of money to sink into a thing you've not experienced yet. It's a big, it's a big ask. Um, but that's all for us uh, this week. Uh, wherever you are, be it on the bus, at work, at home, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. See you later. We are Unlucky Frog Gaming, and I am Ben. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Unlucky Frog Gaming. You can also show your support by giving us money through the Unlucky Frog Patreon. And be sure to check out our website, unluckyfrog.com, to find out more. (laughs) 